third week of December. That means from 14 December, we can expect today is the 8th. So from 14 December, we can expect fleet management to start online interviews. And from what it appears, they don't seem to have much of experience with online interviews because they were asking me how it is to be done. And our boys have already gone through several interviews online. So you must be reasonably familiar with Zoom because a lot of seminars have taken place through Zoom and the other one is WebEx. These are the two. Of course, there are a horde of other means of communicating through online services, but Zoom and WebEx are the two common ones. And uh, you need to keep yourself very, very computer savvy. And another thing is when you speak on the computer, try to keep your face focused on the computer screen. You need not look exactly at the camera. That is where you are actually making eye contact. But at least keep looking at the screen. Do not look elsewhere. And be very focused. Have thoughts in your mind when you are speaking and looking into the TV screen, uh, into the monitor. So we have, at, uh, as of now, 29 cadets. I'm going to give only five minutes more because there's a lot of subject matter that needs to be covered. Today, what today what we are going to cover is combustion in diesel engines, combustion process. This is also a very important process. And the syllabus that we have is combustion of fuels in IC engines. That means you need to understand something about fuel. <coughs> We are marine engineers, we are going to deal with engines and machinery. Now, if you're going to deal with engines, you need to also deal with fuel. So your concepts on fuel has to be very clear. Then we go into the combustion process, some basics in combustion process, grades of suitable fuels, preparation of fuels for efficient combustion, fuel atomization, ignition quality, that will come in the next class. We can't finish so much in one class. Then we'll go into fuel injectors. The modern fuel injectors are all electronic controlled. They are common rail systems. And he has not said anything about common rail systems, but I will include it because that is more of a modern process that is being used by engines. Okay, so we have 31 students as of now. It's still 9.34. Another one or two minutes and we can start our subject matter on. Okay, Shubhankar is here. And this is the sixth PowerPoint program that I have made. And I think there's a lot of pages that are there. Who's come? Sankalp Gupta. Actually, this is why I want you boys and girls to come in time. Every time I have to admit a student, I have to remove the original screen that I was actually presenting to you and explaining to you. It's something like somebody coming in through the door in the class. Yes, what is it, Bhartwaj? Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, sir, last morning. time you gave us uh, the question why general bearing is not in a single piece uh, and why it is uh, uh, shrunk fit. Uh, so, uh, sir, I wanted, uh, uh, I uh, looked after the answer and uh, the answer I came uh, to is that the if we will uh, make the journal and the uh, web uh, in a single piece, the, we will not be able to uh, make a, such a large and big, uh, large and big crankshaft and we will not be able to uh, fix it uh, and make it in a single uh, in a single piece as uh, we will not able to uh, make it according to the angle it will be working uh, as uh, angle between two consecutive cranks uh, will not be able to be determined when we are making such large crankshaft so it is nearly impossible to make it and it will be very costly 
my question was a little different from what you have assumed. <clears throat> my question was, why is it that the journal is shrunk fit with the web? Why couldn't the crank pin be shrunk fit with the crank web? Shubh, okay, sir. have you understood? I, my yes, sir. Yes, sir. Difficulty in aligning the crankshaft is not a difficulty. They have modern processes by which the angles can be positioned so that they are joined together at the exact point. There is almost no error in their positioning of the crank throws to assemble them together. That is not an issue at all. My question was, why is it that the journal, that is the one that supports the entire crankshaft, why is in that shaft welded to the, or made one piece with the crank web? Why is it the crank pin is made one piece with the web. Because what you see, if there is excessive torque, it will cause the entire crankshaft to slip. The journal can slip over the web. So instead of having the slippage, you could avoid it by having the throw made with the two webs and the journal, and the holes can be made in the crank web to have the crank pin shrunk fit on the web. Why isn't that procedure followed? That was my question. Sir, can you please repeat? I was Excuse not me, able sir. to catch <clears throat> properly. All right, sir, once again. Uh, yes, sir, maybe, sir, maybe to have a continuous grain flow across the web and crank pin that offers better structural strength. Okay, the crank flow will be this time through the main journal. It need not be through the crank pin. I'm just reversing the position of the main journal and the crank pin. Why isn't the crank pin shrunk fit with the web? And only the journal is shrunk fit with the web. The crank throw is made with two webs and a crank pin. Why couldn't the crank throw be made with two webs and the main journal? That will be one piece, but it is always the journal that is shrunk fit and the crank pin is made one piece with the webs. Did you understand, Shubh? Yes, sir. So that is the question. Try to do a little thinking. It's not a very difficult question. It does not require rocket science to understand this. All it requires is a little practical concept. Our Marine engineers are extremely practical in their professional. It is not theory, it is not high rocket science or things like that. Not very much of deep thinking required. But real practical situations that are dealt with on board the ship out at sea. Okay, anyway, let's start our subject. And we have a new PowerPoint now. And this was the class test question for section A. Section B, Section C, Section D. What is stoichiometric ratio in the combustion process? Actually, whatever has been given in the PowerPoint was asked of you. And in your section, you were asked to draw a piston assembly of a four trunk. Everybody, I have not yet still finished all the papers. And boys have done reasonably well. So today we start our subject on a new chapter and the chapter is fuels and combustion in diesel engines. Now fuels is one part of our area where we engineers have need to have a reasonable amount of information. And that is the information that we are going to deal with today with, <clears throat> with the basics, very basics. What are the types of fuels that are available in the market? What are the fuels used by the diesel engines? Why they are used? And what are the regulations? A little bit of regulations are involved so that you don't get the incorrect fuel on board. So there are means and methods by which a regulation can be put in so that you don't get incorrect quality of fuel for your engines. And there are governing bodies which ensure that such things don't happen. Otherwise, you will land up with fuels which are totally incompatible with your engines and then your engines are going to suffer very, very badly. In fact, a large 
amount of faults that arise in engines, all engines, is the quality of fuel that is being used. If you have very good quality of fuel, your engines will remain in very good health. Whereas if you use poor quality of fuel, your engines are going to have a lot of illnesses. And ultimately, to run an engine, economy is the primary concern. So an economy would mean buying the cheapest fuel. But buying the cheapest fuel again will cause problems with the engine. Samir Patel. Okay, last man in. After this, no more. So we have 31 or 32 only. Anyway, so that is the reason why we burn a quality of fuel which is compatible with the engine. So a little basics about the fuel. When you have crude oil which is extracted from the soil, it is passed through a furnace, whereas in that furnace, you have a heating arrangement which causes that fuel to boil. And at various boiling temperatures along the fractionating tower, you have condensation taken out. And that condensed fluid, which becomes liquid again, is in the form of either fuel oil, diesel oil, kerosene, naphtha, gasoline, and refinery gases, which emerge right at the top as still gases. So this is a fractionating tower. And this is where various fuels are permitted. Okay, a little more in detail about this fractionating tower. Here you have a furnace. This furnace is which receives the crude oil. And once the crude oil comes into the furnace, it starts boiling. And as it keeps boiling, at various levels, the temperatures are such that the products which condense at these temperatures come out as different forms. So you get naphtha, diesel oil, light diesel oil, gas oil. And at the lowest point, what you get is residue. This residue is a mixture of sludge, mixture of residual fuel and the heaviest grades. Residual fuel and the ones that are coming out after condensation, they are called distillate fuels, all right? So there is a marked difference between residual fuels and distillate fuels. The residual fuels in today's market is getting poorer and poorer and poorer. Why? Because, you see, these oil companies, oil refineries, they are extracting the most of the distillates from the fuel. And what is left over is residual this residual is given to shipping industry to burn because it is the cheapest grade of fuel. In fact, all the important ingredients have been extracted. It is like having milk in the market and it is super toned milk. That means all the products have been removed. You only get white color with that liquid and that is called toned milk. All right. But here, what you're getting is the residue of that crude oil. That means all the volatile constituents are removed and they are used for so many products. You must have studied organic chemistry in school. And I will not go into detail of it because we lose a lot of time. So these are the products which come out from the uh, distillates. The distillates means the one that is boiled off and condensed. So you will get gasoline, that's petrol, you get naphtha, you get kerosene, you get diesel oil, you get fuel oil. This fuel oil is usually used for lubricating oils. But the residue also consists some amount of residual fuel. This residual fuel is thick. It does not burn easily in some cases. And it is the cheapest in the market. So the ship owner's intention is to have minimum cost for running his engines. And, but at the same time, he wants his engines to run very safely, satisfactorily, without any problem. So you as an engineer, you are given the responsibility of running an engine with the poorest grades of fuel. And at the same time, they don't want you to have any problems with the engine. So you're holding the short end of the stick and you've got a tough deal to follow up on. Okay. Now, what residual fuel comes out from different parts of the world have got different properties. So the oil that you get from Venezuela 
will not be the same as you get from Dubai, and that will not be the same as what you get from, say, Indonesia. So these are the places the oil quality is totally different. So you need an engine which is compatible with a wide range of fuels. All right. Now, what are these fuels? Let's have a look at them. Crude oil, what is the process? How it is? Let's go into the process first. The crude oil is heated in a furnace heater and the lightest and most volatile hydrocarbons boil off first as vapor and the heaviest and the least at last. There you see the most volatile products are your gasoline, that's petrol, and then is naphtha, then is kerosene, then is diesel oil. So the lightest grades boil off first. So at the lowest temperature, at 70 degrees centigrade, you can condense that gas into petrol. Likewise, little lower is 120 naphtha. A little lower than that is your kerosene. So various levels, you get various grades of the fuel. Okay. These vapors are cooled at various stages of temperatures and condensed into liquids. So that is why you get kerosene, naphtha, gasoline, aviation fuel, so on and so forth. The lower groups are the heavier groups. Okay. Now crude oils are hydrocarbons and can broadly be divided into three groups. This is a very broad distinction between in hydrocarbons. First group is the paraffin group. The paraffin group is the best quality. It is the one that burns best without any black smoke. Very good quality. If you see the candles that you have in your home, when you light a candle, you don't get black smoke. That, of course, depends on the size of that wick which you're burning. If you have a very large wick, then, of course, you might get some smoke. But if you get a standard size of wick on the candle and you burn it, you see that candle is burning without any black smoke coming out. This wax that you use comes from the paraffinic group of hydrocarbons. And the formula is CnH2n plus 2. So ultimately what you have, various paraffinic compounds which come as methane, ethane, propane, butane, and waxes. So this can be anywhere in the formula from CN, CH4 to C25H52 and possibly more. I'm, I'm not so detailed about organic chemistry in this matter, but you must have heard about methane, ethane, propane, and butane, and the waxes. Waxes is the one the candles are made of. These ignite most easily in diesel engines. You know, when you get paraffinic oils on board the ship, every all engineers are very happy. Why? They know they will not get so much of carbon deposits inside the engine. Most of the fuel will burn out and, all, and the engine remains very, very clean. Now, methane is also a product as a fuel and it is being used on large ships as basic fuel. Butane is the gas that you use in your kitchen. In fact, it is a com the gas bottles, gas cylinders that you have in your home is a combination of butane and propane. Butane is about 80% and propane is about 20%. This is the one that is used in the domestic cooking purposes. All right. And there are blue colors, the, the cylinders that you use, they are red color cylinders. And they are mainly butane and some amount of propane. Very difficult to separate the two out. So butane is the main gas. Whereas some gas cylinders are used for your automobile autos. And that gas is sometimes either methane separately or sometimes you use those blue color gas cylinders they are using for welding gas welding. And that blue color cylinder, not very common. They have 80% propane and about 20% butane. So there's a distinction between the two. Butane and propane in 
gas cylinders which are in the domestic fridge a domestic purpose and the blue color cylinders they have 80% propane and 20% butane methane is same as natural gas when you say lng what does lng mean lng means liquefied natural gas natural gas is methane all right and uh, what is lpg lpg is liquefied petroleum gas all right liquefied petroleum gas could be anything propane butane mixture of all these gases so that is liquefied petroleum lpg and lng is liquefied natural gas or cng is the same as lng so natural gas is methane do not forget because in your class 4 exams in the in the mmd these questions are asked what is lng okay he will say same and what is cng okay that is also this so is there any difference between the two there is no difference between cng and lng only thing one is compressed and one is liquefied one is using temperatures which are very low up to minus 162 degree centigrade to keep it in the liquid form so lng cng is the same lpg is petroleum gases it could be ethane propane butane everything else except methane okay remember the paraffinic group is the group that burns most easily in on an engine so it is the most preferred gas that has to be there next what you have is naphthenes the second group are naphthenes these are also called olefins and they have a formula called cnh2n all right the other one was cnh2n plus 2 that is your methanes or your uh, paraffins this one is the second group these are asphaltic in nature asphaltic meaning they have products which don't burn easily and asphalt is a precipitate inside the oil it's almost like sludge and this asphalt it is not totally useless this asphalt is sometimes used for road making you see asphalt layered bitumen asphalt pitch these are of the same grade with slight differences in the formulations but asphalt bitumen pitch they come in the same block of categories so they are used for road making and for a particular range in boiling temperature this is more difficult to burn than paraffins so you may get naphthenes mixed with paraffins to burn so it will burn reasonably well but not as good as pure paraffins so these consist of ethylene butylene and propylene okay these are naphthenic group and the third group is the aromatics you might have heard of benzene most of your aromatic products perfumes and a lot of other stuff that are made with this group of hydrocarbons and their formula is just ch benzene is one of the ones um, um, most common and relevant group i i don't want to go to go too much into this organic chemistry because it's a huge huge subject and once you delve into it there is no coming back it ends it is endless this group is still more difficult to burn in the diesel engine so basically what you need to know is that paraffinic group is the most easy to burn and they consist of methane ethane propane butane and wax that's all that's all you need to know the second group is the naphthenes and they are also called olefins and they are ethylene butylene propylene all the leans are here and they are having a little bit of asphaltic in nature which is difficult to burn and the last group is the aromatics aromatics means they have got a very distinctive smell and this is in the benzene group and not very commonly used on the ships but it is used in some places but not very commonly and this is very difficult to burn on board the ship now the shipping industry uses various grades of diesel oil actually there are two grades 
mainly two grades. In some cases, you may have, may have a third grade. First one is the residual fuel. The residual fuel is the cheapest grade of fuel, most difficult to burn. And in the winter, it is very thick, very thick. It is so thick in European countries, when your ship will go to European countries, it will be a very difficult exercise to take the sounding of the tank. Sounding of the tank means taking the depth of oil inside a tank which is below the tank top. Or it can be anywhere else also. <laughs> the overhead tanks also, you take a sounding of the tank, which means you are measuring the level of oil inside the tank. That is what, when the chief engineer or second engineer tells you, go take the soundings of all the heavy oil tanks. So you have to know which are the heavy oil tanks and take the sounding. It means measure the level of oil inside that tank. Now in winter, especially in European countries, that sounding bob, in other words, the brass metal bob, which is fixed at the end of the tip. This is a measuring tip. All right. And you have a similar spool on board the ship. Of course, it's much bigger and it's got a hand wheel on it. Same thing as your measuring tape on the fields if you have done it with ordinary tape. But the one that is used for oil is the same thing which is like your normal steel tape. And at the end of the steel tape, you have a bob. The bob is strictly made of brass. Why it is made of brass is a question for you. So this bob is supposed to sink into the oil and ultimately you get the measurement of the oil level at a certain point. When you remove it, you take that reading and you refer to a manual. And in the manual for a particular level, you have so much of oil. And then there are corrections Do If the ship is perfectly horizontal or even keel, then you get the correct level immediately. But if the ship is at a, at a trim or it is down by head, then the oil tank levels are all haywire. So for that, you need a correction. And the correction figures are also given in the sounding tables, where if the trim is by 20 centimeters, the reading will be this. If it is down by head, it will be this. So it is similar to your log tables. You must have seen log tables or your, what do you call that? In your refrigeration, you use that. I forget the name. It's a table, book of tables. Steam, steam tables. Ah, steam tables. It is similar to your steam tables where the sounding of all the tanks are given and the values of the quantity of oil will be depending on the trim of the ship. If the trim of the ship is like that, then the oil will also take a different shape. So when you take the measurement, you will not get the correct value. So that correction is required in the value depending on what is the trim of the ship or if it is down by head. So that is how you calculate the quantity of oil inside a tank. And when you get, you get only the volume. Therefore, you have to multiply it by the density to get the mass. Okay. So <clears throat> that is very essential on board the ship. Now, if that oil is cold, residual fuel, it becomes very thick and it is very difficult to get the sounding bob inside the oil. It will go in slightly and you cannot make out if it has reached the bottom end of the tank. So what we do, the fifth engineer has to be very smart on board the ship. He has to find out what is the total length of the tank from the bottom till the top of the sounding pipe. All right. That is very essential. So when he lowers the bob, only about, say, 5 centimeters of the bob will get into the oil. So he measures the level of the tape that has gone on that level, and then he calculates the allage value. Once he gets the allage value, he knows what is the value of the level of the tank without the bob going right to the bottom. So that value he will use and find out from the tables and get the correct quantity of oil in the tank. All right. Now, this is very, very crucial. I remember making a mistake the first time I was on the ship. 
and I had to get a earful from the chief engineer. Because based on your reports, the chief engineer will determine how much oil he has on board. And based on that, he will order for the next bunker. Now, if you give him a wrong reading and he orders a wrong reading, then it is chaotic when the oil comes on board. Because the barge that brings the oil, if you don't, don't take all the oil and it takes back some of the oil because you don't have space in your tank, then he gets the oil. But you will have to pay for that oil. You will not get a refund. You cannot tell him, I cannot take the oil. He will tell you, you have ordered for this oil, you have to take the oil. If you don't take it, you are losing the oil. We will take it back and sell it somewhere else. It becomes our property. So you have to be very careful about what is the quantity of oil on board the ship. And the fifth engineer is largely responsible for calculating the quantity of oil. He can get it checked by a senior engineer. It may happen once or twice in the beginning. But thereafter, you will be responsible to report that figure of oil to the chief engineer. And chief engineer will order oil based on how much he has on board, how much will be consumed till the next port, minus that figure, he has to place the order. Once he places the order, he has to take that quantity of oil. Now, if you have told him that we've got so much of oil and actually we don't have, then he will take that oil and you will still find there's so much of space in his tank. So then he is not able to go to the next port, next uh, voyage. He runs short. Now he has to explain to the company why he has taken less oil. Similarly, if he orders more oil than what he has got space for, it's going to be a bigger problem because the company is going to accuse him of losing money for the company because he cannot take that oil. And there is no place in the tanks. So then it, again it becomes a problem. So this calculation of quantity of oil in the tanks has to be done very, very accurately. All right. And there are multiple number of tanks. There are overhead tanks. There are about double bottom tanks and all of different sizes. So you need to calculate. And then the ship has a trim. And if it has a trim, you're in deep trouble. You, uh, the... The indicators will show it is full when it is not full. That is the way it is. Anyway, that is another part of the story. So let's have residual fuel is the thickest oil. Okay, Saurav Kumar has got a question. Hold it. Shubham Sivastav, old peens have two general formulas, CNH2N and CNH2N plus 2. H C N H two N plus two is in the paraffins. It is not in all fins. Sir, it's CN, minus two, sir. C N H two N minus two on alkenes and alkynes. Okay, we don't need to go so much in depth with the uh, hydrocarbons. I have not gone so much in depth. It's just a basic concept of which oil burns well, which do not burn well, will be adequate. All right. So next question is. The main reason for using the brass is the density difference. The density of brass is around so much, whereas the density of heavy fuel is... a ah, silly answer you're giving. Saurav, never mind, you've given an answer. I'm asking you, why is it made of brass and why it cannot be made of mild steel? Why it cannot be made of cast iron? Why it cannot to be made prevent of... Wear, sir, to prevent wear down of the bob, sir. No, no way, no way at all. No... But I'm giving, okay, do a little thinking. I'm not going to give you so quickly. Do a little thinking because it is a very, very crucial question for fifth engineer. And this piece of information is a gold nugget. You know what is a gold nugget? Why a sounding bob is made of brass and not made of steel, cast iron, uh, stainless steel, or any other metal. Why it is made of brass? Okay, do a little thing. I will give you the answer in the end, but try to rack your brains and decide why. Okay, it is a very important gold nugget of information. Okay, next is distillate fuels. This The shipping industry also uses distillate fuels. And this distillate fuel is what you saw in that 
fractionating challenge, uh, column. And light distill ale is very good quality oil. And it has a very limited use because it is very costly. And it is mainly used in areas where the emergency generator will be used, lifeboat engine will be used, or if there is an outboard motor for your rescue boat, that can be used for marine gas oil. Otherwise, distillate fuel, ordinary marine diesel oil is used in your auxiliary engines. And sometimes the auxiliary engines are also using the residual fuel. But the auxiliary engines will have a, a arrangement where it can burn marine diesel conveniently along with heavy oil or residual fuel. So normally when you want to do an overhaul job on an auxiliary engine, you let the diesel oil come into the lines and clean up the injectors and remove any deposits of heavy oil. So it becomes easier to do the decarbonizing. But heavy oil to dismantle the engine when the engine has been running on heavy oil will result in very thick, sticky oil, very difficult to clean. So we use diesel oil just before decarbonizing a unit. It's okay. So let's go on to the next plate. <clears throat> Various names are used by suppliers for residual fuel. Now, on board the ship, we don't call it residual fuel. We call it heavy oil. Heavy oil is the standard name we use on board. But by the bunker party, charter party, the shipping company, the refineries, they have different names for this residual fuel. And they are sometimes called bunker C fuel. They are also called heavy fuel. That is most commonly used, the term that is used on board the ship. And the third one is bunker fuel oil. That is also heavy oil. And the fourth name for it is marine fuel oil. In US, they will be calling it bunker C fuel. In United Kingdom, they will say bunker fuel oil. In Rotterdam, they will say marine fuel oil. On board the ship, you are using heavy oil. So, Sagar Date has got an answer. Uh, brass have less effective on temperature on it compared to steel and cast iron. Well, you are coming close. You are coming close. A little more. Give it a little better. You are coming close to the answer. Uh, next is about the heavy oil. These are high viscosity and cheapest available. High viscosity means they are very thick oils. Intermediate fuels are blends of residual and distillate fuels. You see, most of these suppliers, what they do, they bring the worst quality of fuel, the cheapest one. And then they mix a little bit of diesel oil to make it a little thin. And then they sell it to the ship. So these mixed oils, which has some amount of distillate mixed with the residual fuel to make it more uh, fluid, they are called blends. A blend is a mixture of residual and distillate fuel. And most commonly, these are the fuels that are given on board. Okay. Next, the International Standards Organization, which is called ISO. Everybody must have heard of ISO. Gives the specifications for marine fuels under IS 8217. Now remember this code for the rest of your life till eternity. IS8217. This is the code given for marine fuels by International Standards Organization. All right. And all the types of fuels which can be used for marine purposes is under IS8217. All right. Now, this IS8217 IS code gives a variety of fuels. Okay. <clears throat> And this code is sometimes updated. It has been updated six times so far. The original time, it was in the 90s, early eight, late 80s and early 90s, 1996, I think. Thereafter, several upgradation, updating of the specifications within the code. No, Sagar Date, I'll come to it. Uh, I'll come to that answer. Let me finish with this explanation. Pay full attention here. Now, don't worry about brass bobs. 
the international standards organization it gives specifications for marine fuels under is8217 remember this number for the rest of your life because this is the code under which all marine fuels are categorized and sometimes this code and the fuels data are updated periodically 1996 was one of the earliest thereafter 2005 then 2012 and the latest one is 2017 where they have made some inputs where biodiesels have also been included otherwise previous to this 2017 year biodiesels were not there so is8217 is a code which specifies all the marine fuels all right and these marine fuels specifications are sometimes upgraded these upgraded come in different editions the last edition was 2017 all right the next edition i expect will be 2022 where they will specify the sulfur levels that are permissible from 2020 possibly by 22 911 uh this 911 is a scam so uh, what i was saying mm. in 2022 possibly a new edition will come out okay now in that they will give all the new regulations that are imposed by international maritime organization and one of the regulations mainly on sulfur all of you must be aware that sulfur previously allowed in marine fuels was up to 3.5% and that burning of those fuels was causing enormous amount of pollution to contain that pollution IMO has made a very strong regulation that by 2021st of January you can burn fuels of only 0.5% sulfur so from 3.5% it has come down to 0.5% that is a dramatic change so lot of changes had to be there and it is not only changes of the fuel in the tanks the changes in the engines also had to take place so 0.5% is a very low quantity this is one and the emission controlled areas that in some parts of the world where they are very strict about pollution have reduced the sulfur to 0.1% okay so now if you have 0.1% you need to make some changes on the engine also but we will not discuss that at the moment we are only discussing about fuels So 0.5 percent is the present requirement of all diesel, whether it is residual, whether it is uh, light diesel, whether it is distillate, any fuel. Sulfur must not exceed 0.5 percent all over the world, and 0.1 percent in certain areas around the world: Europe, North Atlantic, California, Caribbean. So there are several places these are called eca emission controlled area there is also a places which is called seca if you have a pen and paper you can write it down because i don't have it in my powerpoint one is eca and is one is seca eca means emission controlled areas this controls everything whether it is sulfur dioxide whether it is nitrogen dioxide or any pollutant this is all seca has sulfur emission controlled areas that means strictly sulfur is being controlled in those areas okay now what is the sulfur content in the diesel oil that is being used in our country in india for the vehicles it is 0.1% the same diesel oil is being used for ships in europe we are using that oil for our roads what is the sulfur content of the diesel oil that is used in europe 0.002% so almost no sulfur is there in the diesel oil 
that is used in vehicles in Europe. And in spite of that, they want to stop that because the NOx is something they are trying to control. In time, all of Europe will stop using diesel oil or petrol. They will be using electric cars. Already Norway has got 60% or more of their vehicles under electric cars. So that is the main reason why we are trying to reduce sulfur. It's a very long-drawn subject regarding pollution and the solutions to using fuels which will not cause pollution. In fact, by 2050, 2050 is another how many years from now, another 30 years. By 30 years, no more fossil fuel will be permitted anywhere in the world. So, uh, you will have non-fossil fuels. Non-fossil fuels means those without carbon. Our intention is to have a smaller carbon print in the world. So that is why we are going to do away with fossil fuels. Fossil fuels means charcoal, wood, petroleum. These are all having carbon and we want to stop using carbon. Right now, the pressure is on using methane, LNG, CNG. But these are also having carbon. They are basically hydrocarbon. They can be permissible for a short period of time, but gradually they will also go out of space. So what is the solution? The solution is hydrogen. Hydrogen is a very good fuel. But to bring about use of hydrogen, the infrastructure is going to be initially very costly. So hydrogen is going to be one fuel. Apart from that, ammonia. Ammonia is also going to be a fuel, but they have their drawbacks also. Those drawbacks are going to be addressed. If you go into the net, you will see by in the first half of 2021, what Sila is coming out with an engine which will burn only ammonia. And it will only have ammonia as the fuel on that ship which will be going across the Atlantic. I am very keen about that particular ship and what it's going to perform. But it is going to be in the first half of 2021. They are going to use a ship which is going to cut across the Atlantic on ammonia as the fuel. Ammonia will not cause any pollution. Yes, Sir Saki, you have something to say? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, actually, it's an opinion of mine, sir. I uh, wanted to say that we already the shipping industry is already will anyway make much uh, more pollution than any other industry be it transport industry or aviation okay, industry that's true. so sir yes uh, how how come if y yes sir sorry your words are not coming across uh, yes, sir. so I was saying that uh, okay. ma maritime industries anyway, anyway produce uh, like uh, do more pollution than any other uh, major two industries. So, so how come? How only we are? Uh, how will the pollution control if only all the impl implementations are done okay. in, in okay. maritime okay. industry okay. only? Okay, 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 okay. Right now we have very strict regulations regarding burning fuels which have a sulfur content and that action has already been taken from the 1st of January this year where the sulfur level has been reduced to 0.5% on a worldwide scale. In the emission controlled areas which is Europe, North Atlantic, Caribbean, California, areas of California, these are using fuels which are 0.1% sulfur content. But sulfur is not the only pollution. The other pollution is caused by NOx. That means oxides of nitrogen. All right. Now, to prevent oxides of nitrogen, ships have mandatorily required to limit the NOx discharge. This can be done through NOx control. And to control NOx, there are several means. One of the most common means 
is to install a selective catalytic reduction unit scr this is a device where the nox can be controlled by injecting ammonia vapor so that ammonia reacts with nox to produce nitrogen and water nh3 is ammonia no2 is nox all right so ammonia uh, the the reaction is such that only nitrogen is discharged so that is how nox is controlled and sulfur is also being controlled by using scrubbers a scrubber is similarly like a tower with a rain falling arrangement so water is sprinkled down in small droplets and the gas is allowed to pass up so the gas is washed and any sulfur dioxide sulfur trioxide that is washed out comes as a residue or a solution at the bottom this solution is again neutralized by means of using alkali so if you have acid and alkali ultimately you are getting salt and water so that salt is then carefully disposed of in septic receptacles on shore you see we have controlled air pollution but what happens to that sediment that is collected towards the end that is also a pollutant where are you going to throw that on shore then you are polluting the shore you are not polluting the atmosphere you have saved the atmosphere from pollution you have saved the sea from pollution but ultimately that pollutant has to be discarded somewhere where are you going to discard it that is the reason why fossil fuels are going to be removed altogether in time to come the objective of stopping pollution means stopping pollution in air in sea and on land and so long as we keep burning fossil fuels we will keep contaminating the environment which is the air the sea and the land so fossil fuels have to go and only non fossil fuels like hydrogen like ammonia like nuclear power these are the only solutions we have towards stopping fossil fuels there is a program but for the intermediate stage we are trying to reduce the amount of pollutants that we are discharging to 2008 levels 2020 and what we did in 2008 that is our present objectives so the subject is very large very huge it will take us at least four times our ice syllabus to compare that particular subject on pollution control and the means that are used to control but remember in time fossil fuel will go that is the ultimate by 2050 there will be no more fossil fuels permitted anywhere in the world that is the objective how far that will take place only time will tell so let's go on with our subject others we are not making any headway now remember this number is8217 is a code for all marine fuels and the specifications are given on this i'm going to give you some more now another part that you need to know is cmac cmac is an organization and that is a consultative organization that deals with research with diesel engines and fuels that are being used so it is actually conceal international dust machines are combustion that a that you see over there is not a it is a as pronounced by the french the english version or english interpretation of that organization name is international council on combustion engines it's a very interesting council if you go on the site you can find enormous amount of information coming from this particular organization they give specifications regulations they give uh, all advice they give lot of information the uh, level is unbelievable and they deal with all combustion engines whether it is spark ignition whether it is gas turbine whether it is diesel com compression ignition engines all about combustion engines they are a complete consultative organization for all information related to engines and fuels both 
So they have made recommendations regarding fuel requirements for diesel engines based on IS 8217. All right. Now remember, the ISO is not a government body. It's a non-governmental organization, but it has set some standards. Those standards are generally followed by many countries. Let's go on to the next plate. The ISO or International Standards Organization, sometimes it is called International Standards Organization or International Organization for Standardization. This is the real expression of ISO. It should have been IOS, but no, it is ISO. But when you name the company, you call it International Organization for Standardization. Okay is a worldwide network of national standards bodies of 163 and more countries. ISO is a non-governmental organization, which means that its members are not, as in the case of United Nations system, for example, delegations of national governments. ISO is not a governmental authority. It is a separate private, not even private, it is an organization which belongs to nobody and everybody. So it does not, no government authority has any say in it. It is an organization which specifies certain standards to be followed. And most countries follow it because they are a genuine organization and they cannot be giving something that is detrimental to any organization. Okay. International standards give state-of-the-art specification. That means the ideal specification for products, services, and good services, and good practices, helping to make industry more efficient and effective. They make things work. All right. So when you buy or purchase oil, okay, here, let's read it through. ISO standards are developed through global consensus they help to break down barriers to international trade. This is the purpose of ISO. Now, same thing comes into when you buy fuel oil for your ships. You don't buy it from anywhere. You buy the oil that has been specified by the ISO that is satisfactory for maritime or marine use. Okay. ISO 821 specific, uh, specifications of marine fuels. Now, ISO 8217 is used in a commercial agreement between the buyer and supplier, and it gets only legal standing when included in a vessel's charter party agreements and fuel purchasing contracts. Now, a shipping company will make a contract with a charter party. The charter party will only assure you that this oil which is being used on the ship has to come with ISO specifications. Without ISO specifications, that oil will not be valid for the ship. So when you buy, when you get the oil, it will be specified by ISO that these are the parameters of the oil that need to be existent. Okay. So ISO 8217 is used in a commercial agreement between buyer and supplier and gains only legal standing when included in vessels charter party agreements and fuel purchasing contracts. If you don't have this agreement, then when you have a dispute, no court will attend to your dispute. So there are a lot of issues involved in the fuel that you buy and use. All right. But as of now, this should be only a pre preliminary guidance to you. It is not included in your subject matter for examinations. This is just a guidance to tell you how the oil comes about on board the ship, what it has to follow, the importance of getting the correct oil on board, how it comes about. So these are the guidelines. Adopting to the latest revision of ISO 8217 offers improved quality control, better protection against engine damage, harmful emissions, and safeguards of crew. I think the last point is the most important. Otherwise, if that oil is not suited for burning, it could 
cause you a lot of damage. In fact, as it is, the number of chemicals that are there on board the ship, you have to be very, very careful. It happened to me once I opened a can of sodium hypochlorite for a sewage tank and I collapsed there only. Before I could do anything, the gas that came out from that container, of course, it had all that red marks and skeleton and of sort, sorry, what do you call it? The skull and bone sign, all that was there. And they give you on board. After that, it's your responsibility. So when I opened that, the gas was so strong, I collapsed. And I, while collapsing, I knew it is coming from there. So I managed to put the cover on top and then fall. Of course, immediately other people came. They put water on me. We made sure that was not opened. They themselves covered themselves with masks, removed that container, and we were back to a normal walk. But be very, very careful on board the ship because a lot of products come on board for magic performance, for cleaning a surface, just a, one cup full of it, and you see it gets cleaned. But if that liquid falls on your hand, your hand won't be there. So you have to be very careful with products that come on the ship. And to regulate these products, you have ISO as the guiding element. Adopting to the latest revision of ISO 8217 offers improved quality control, better protection against engine damage, harmful emissions, and safeguards to crew. Okay. The specifications of marine fuels under ISO 8217 comes under class F. That is the class. There are several classes which we don't need to go into because there's huge, subject is huge. ISO 8217-2017, that is the latest edition of the eight ISO 8217. I expect the, the next edition to come out in 2022. All right. So the ISO 8217-2017 is the sixth edition of the ISO 8217, which replaces the 2012 version. That means before this edition, 2012 edition was the last edition. And before the 12 one, 2012 edition, it was in the 2005 edition. So next, I expect it will be in the 2022. Maybe if you go into ISO website, they will probably be dealing with the subject. I have not had the time to go into it, so I cannot give you the latest information. But ISO 8217-2017, is the current edition of specifications for marine fuels. I'll give you the chart just now. So this sixth edition of ISO has some changes from the previous edition. One is addition of a new class of distillates for allowing biofuel blends. So only in the distillate group, you have some additional fuels which are included for marine use. And they are called biofuel blends and these biofuel blends are actually esters ester is allowed in the fuel up to seven percent so that is why this addition is the only change in the sixth edition where fuels are concerned other than this the introduction of further cold flow checks for distillate fuels that means <clears throat> What flows through an orifice for distillate fuels is also checked. Something new, actually. A change of the scope to allow inclusion of hydrocarbons from synthetic or renewable sources. You don't have to mug up these points. These are only for some information related to the new class of fuels in ISO 8217-2017. These are the new additions. And the last one is the allowable sulfur content has been lowered. They have not told you how much. That is after IMO has confirmed that from 2020, the oil content will be below 3.5%. It will be down to 0.5%. So he has not said how much it will be lowered. He has only said the allowable sulfur content has been lowered. Because this lowering concept has started from 2005. 
how much to lower, how much to lower, how much to lower. So that concept was there much earlier, but it has been executed from 1st of January 2020. So next plate, what we have, the sixth edition introduces DF. See, DF is distillate and F is fame. Fame means fatty acid methyl ester. These are synthetic products which are added as fuel and only up to 7% is added. Okay. So the sixth edition introduces distillate frame grades, which are DFA, DFZ and DFB. D over here stands for distillate, which allow up to 7% fatty acid methyl esters content by volume. Other than the 7% allowance, these grades are same as the traditional DMA, DMZ and DMB grades of all other parameters. That means it is the same. Now the D is indicative of the fuel being distillate. Now, DMA, DMZ, DMB, they are different grades of distillate fuels. And their properties are slightly different. And they are approved for marine use. So you want to buy DMZ grade, grade, it is approved. You want to buy DMB, it is approved. So these are the different grades of the oils for distillate fuels. Similarly, for residual fuels, you have RMA, RMB, RMC, RMD, RMZ. There are a number of grades over there. So they start with the figure R. R means residual. So that's how you distinguish between distillate fuels and residual fuels as charted by the 8217 code. Okay. The DF grades have been introduced to allow for greater use of automotive diesel in the marine distillate fuel. So this automotive diesel were being used in your vehicles on shore and now they are being used in marine distillates pool or marine use that means on board ships which is expected to improve fuel oil availability in some ports which may otherwise struggle to provide fuels complying with the 0.1 percent sulfur limit to ships see you need to carry two grades of of oil one is 0.5 percent sulfur and another grade which is 0.1 percent sulfur okay now they are supposed to separately because your ship will go into places where it has got a restriction of sulfur use to one percent you know what how will they find out they are going to find out by drones this is something new how will you know how will the shore authorities know that you're burning of oh, oh, some phone call? Just a minute, please. Maybe it's an important shipping company. Hello. Yes, good morning. Who is it? No, it is not. I'm taking classes right now. Okay. So you're burning 0.1% or 0.5 percent diesel oil how will the shore authorities know without coming on board you are out in anchorage they cannot come to anchorage to find out and if they look at the oil they can't find out so now what they are doing they are employing drones everybody knows what are drones and these drones will come right up to the ship right to the exhaust funnel and they have sensors which can detect the amount of sulfur dioxide, what is the NOx, these gases can be analyzed then and there by these sensors and transmitted directly to the shore bodies. So these drones are being used to trail a ship behind the funnel and continuously monitor the exhaust gas that is being discharged. And the reports are immediately transmitted through wireless or what do you call that, Wi-Fi to the shore-based computers. And those computers can directly read the level of discharge you're making maybe few kilometers, few nautical miles out at sea. So this 
technology is being used so you cannot dodge the harbor authorities on the quality of oil that you're using on board the ship so it is essential that when you are required to use 0.1 percent fuel use 0.1 percent fuel of course it's much more costly than the 0.5 percent sulfur fuel so this fuel is not easily available 0.1 percent so because of this some bio distillates bio fuels have been introduced in the diesel oil to reduce that sulfur content and help in providing it for the ships otherwise ships cannot go to those areas so the transportation is going to suffer but remember the new techniques that have been used for detecting the sulfur oxide and nox discharge from your ships is being actually held through drones which are going behind ships in exhaust when you funnel you have the exhaust flow and these drones come into that path and they continuously check for a good wheel of time as the ship is moving so we cannot dodge them that is on it this is one and i will tell you another scenario where middle of the night pitch dark and you discharge oil on board outside into the sea and you get caught how do they catch you there is no ship anywhere no patrol boat nothing they have very modern detecting techniques in europe you see middle of the night pitch dark and you're discharging dirty oil into the sea and then you stop after one hour and after four hour you're hundreds of miles away from that place while you're traversing in close proximity to land there are satellites which continuously monitor ships movement and it is through these satellites that the ships know their location their position so those satellites also monitor the vicinity around the ship and they have reflectors on oil surfaces when you discharge oil that oil may sink it may float but if it sinks it leaves behind what is called a sheen s h e e n sheen you might have noticed it you drop oil on water and let the light reflect on that water you will see colorful spread of that oil very colorful multi colors but that light has to be reflected so that is capable of being detected by satellites and that then and there that satellite information reaches port state control and harbor master that such and such ship which is in such and such position is discharging oil and within minutes the captain on the ship will get a call on his vhf captain you are discharging oil so captain will get up from sleep and he'll think it's 2 o'clock in the night nobody can see our ship how does the harbor know i'm discharging oil so that oil that you discharge can be detectable at any time anywhere on the globe so at no time can you discharge oil into the sea or discharge sulfur dioxide and nox into the air so the conditions are becoming very stringent for ships and you have to control pollution to the best you can and in fact i would say as a responsible engineer it has to be taken to heart you have to be dedicated towards control of pollution whether it is in the water whether it is on the shore or whether it is in the sea so this is the reason why fossil fuels are going to be out of our use no matter what protection you use you may use use scrubbers you may use selective catalytic reduction unit all the devices you may use but the end position is that some of that contaminant has to come out either as a liquid or a solid so where are you going to discharge that contaminant on land are you going to bury it into the soil or are you going to bury it into the sea you're still polluting so best is not to have any pollutant coming out of it 
whether it is in sediment, whether it is in liquid, whether it is in solid, that pollutant must not come out from your exercise. And the only way is to take the natural resources, use it, and again natural resources. It's like conservation of energy. You use take out hydrogen from the air or resources, and then you burn it. And ultimately, you produce water. So that is how. Again, you take out the hydrogen from the water and use it and to produce water. So that is the ideal condition. Advantage of hydrogen, it has got enormous amount of heat value. It has got, if fuel has got 40 megajoules, I think hydrogen has got 120 megajoules for the same mass. So the value of hydrogen is considered to be the next best option. Of course, you're using ammonia also as a means. LNG is a sh short period utilization. Methane gas It's going to be a short duration use of fossil fuel. Ultimately, methane is also a fossil fuel and it discharges carbon. And that is exactly what we are trying to stop in time. Okay. So that is that. Let's see the next one. Now, here is the chart which is giving you ISO 8217-2017 fuel standard for marine distillate fuels. All right. Now, this is the these are the parameters set by ISO to ISO to 8217. What all are the parameters? Viscosity, microcarbon residue, density, then you have sulfur content, water content, total sediment, ash content, flash point. Pore point, cloud point, calculated cetane index, acidity number, oxidation, fatty FM. This is the one that has been added. Otherwise, all the previous ones were there. And you don't have to mug up all the data. It is just a guideline to show you that ISO 8217 considers these parameters to be fulfilled to give you an oil which has approval approval for use on board the ship. Your manufacturer of the engine will tell you which grade amongst these are can be used. Several grades can be used, but the ship owner will go on the basis of economy. So he will choose the cheap, cheapest one of the grades that are used. Now here you have different grades of diesel oil. All right. The importance of fuel on board the ship Number one is that it is a fire hazard. And because of this, the flash point of the oil that is to be used on board the ship in the engine room has a limit of 60 degrees centigrade. Have this number embossed in your mind. The flash point of oil used in the engine room is 60 degrees centigrade whether it is residual fuel, whether it is distillate fuel. No question. The flash point has to be 60 degrees centigrade. What about the diesel oil that is used outside the engine room? Outside the engine room means you're using the oil in the emergency generator. You're also using the oil for your lifeboat engine. And you're also possibly using oil for an engine that is for your rescue boat. All these can use a fuel oil which has a residual fuel or a distillate fuel with a flash point less than 60 degrees. That oil comes under group of DMX. You see the flash point of this DMX is 43 degrees centigrade. Sorry, where is it? 43 degrees. Ah, yeah. 43 degrees centigrade. 40 is the flash point of the oil DMX. And this oil is the oil that is permissible in the lifeboat engine, <clears throat> in the emergency generator. You see, why is it permitted to have such a low flash point in the lifeboat engine or in the emergency generator? See, the environment, the space where the lifeboat engine is can be very, very cold. So it needs a lower flash point to ignite. And petrol, gasoline, 
is forbidden on the ship. You cannot use petrol or gasoline or any of those uh, fuels. Only diesel oil is permitted. And diesel oil up to 43 degrees centigrade is permitted for lifeboat and emergency generator. Because these are located in places which can be very cold. The emergency generator is located in your accommodation. And that is in the highest region. Maybe it's on the same deck as the bridge. On the bridge deck. So that engine needs to start quickly, even if it is very cold. So that is why the oil allowed is having a flash point of 43 decently. Otherwise, you see the other oils have got a flash point of 60, 60, 60. So this is in distillate fuel. So this is important as a fire hazard protection. You cannot oil have oils in the engine room with a flash point below 60 degrees centigrade. Apart from this, these diesel oils, they have that DF element introduced. You see DFA, DFZ and DFB. These are the addition, 7% of uh, what do you call fatty acid methyl fatty acid methyl ester. This is a product from a biodiesel. This is the only introduction in the new edition of ISO 8217. And these are the parameters that are responsible to identify the oil has certain minimum characteristics. Okay. So this is for distillate fuels. Now let's have a look at the one chart for the residual fuels. Residual fuel is more or less the same as what you have in the 2012 edition. Only trouble is what he has shown you here, RMA, RMB, RMD, RME, and then RMG, RMK, and there are many more groups. Oh, there are still some more which are not included possibly. Um, I have it in my other book, in the Running and Maintenance by Cowley, that book. So here, if you see the viscosity at 50 degrees centigrade is centistokes. The viscosity is given in centistokes. And as you go in the lower level, the viscosity keeps increasing. Till such time, you have a very high viscosity, which is 700 plus at 50 degrees centigrade. 50 degrees is high temperature. And the density at 15 degrees centigrade is anything from 920 to 960, 945 kg per meter cube. All right. So at the last level, you have oil which is more dense than water. It is 1010. So this oil, if you put it in water, it will sink to the bottom. So it will be a funny sight to see what oil is at the lower level and water is floating on the oil. But this oil is now also used on board the ship. Of course, it's very complicated using this oil on board the ship. One is purification. It is a very difficult task to ensure that the density reduces below one. We need to heat that oil. Once you heat that oil, that oil becomes thin. It becomes it loses its viscosity and loses its density also. So once the density becomes less than one, then you can use it in the purifier to separate it out. So this oil is now coming on board the ship. What does this DMX supply? It, it signifies or specifies the highest grade of diesel oil that can be used on board the ship. It is the best grade of the diesel oil. You see DMX, the flash point is 43 degrees centigrade. That means it ignites very fast and it belongs to the paraffin group. Okay, so DMX oil is the highest grade, but it is not given on board the ship for normal use. It is only given because it is costly also. And it is given only for your emergency generator, lifeboat engine or outboard motor. You can't use this oil. But we use that oil for cleaning our hands after doing decarbonization. Because you need something to clean your hands. Heavy oil, if it is on your hand and you use soap, it is not going to go. 
So you need something else to clean your hands to remove the heavy oil and carbon. And there your DMX, it is like kerosene. It is as good as kerosene oil. Okay. So then you see the specifications. The density is also the lowest. Where is the density? Yeah. Oh, he's not specified the density, but it is given as 8.89. It is about 0.85 to 88. Anything between 0.85 and 0.88 would be the density. So it is a very light density oil, very good quality, very quick it burns, and very clean to use. So that is what is DMX. Okay. And in the heavy oil, you have RMA, RMB, RMD, RME. So all these oils are valid for shipboard use and the ship owner is going to buy the cheapest. So the cheapest one will be the one in the R and K group because it has got the density which is very difficult to handle. So if you get this oil, you are required to actually uh, heat it and then burn it because the density becomes much less. Okay. You don't need to mug up these data, well, be aware that the diesel fuel comes in DMA, DMX, DMB, and the fuel, our residual fuel comes as RMA, RMB, RMD, etc. And these are the parameters which have to be fulfilled with their specifications to qualify for ISO 8217. Okay. Now, when you get that fuel on board, 57, it's already 11 o'clock. I will, uh, oh, okay, uh, this one and the next one we will go. When you get the fuel on board, that fuel is very dirty. So you cannot use that for the ship, for the engines. You need to purify that oil, remove the sludge, remove the dirt, and then use that oil. So all residual fuels contain contaminants. These are largely rust, sand, dust, and refinery catalysts. You see, when the refining process goes on inside that fractionating tower, they use catalytic fines. And these catalytic fines are oxides of aluminum and silicon. All right. So how they are used, I don't know, but they are used. So these catalysts are used to speed up the process of distillation or evaporation or, you know, condensation. This whole process of fractionating is using catalysts. And these catalysts are aluminum oxide and silicon oxide. Now, when the residual fuel comes out, little bit of that catalytic fines also comes out. Of course, they have large filters to stop a large amount of it coming out. Nevertheless, small quantities of aluminum oxide and silicon oxide also come out. And these are very hard in nature and they form very, very strong abrasives. It is like having sand between the two rubbing surfaces. Okay. Apart from refinery catalysts, you also have salt or fresh water in the liquid form. Okay. It may also contain several soluble and dissolved substances as sulfates, nitrates and vanadium. These are dissolved. You cannot filter them out. They are mixed. It is like having sugar dissolved in water. Can you separate the sugar? You can't separate it. Similarly, vanadium is dissolved in that oil and you cannot filter it out. You cannot separate it out. Standard procedures in preparation of fuel require operation of two centrifugal purifiers and they are called centrifuges. One is a purifier and one is a clarifier. And these are used in series. First the purifier, then the clarifier. The purifier removes water, insoluble sludge, and some amount of solids, while the clarifier removes the remaining diminutive solid. I mean, very small particles can be removed by the clarifier. Okay. The fuel oil is heated to around 90 degrees centigrade to ease flow and reduce viscosity and density to help remove impurities. See, if the oil is thick, it is very difficult to remove the impurity. But if it is thin like water, then it becomes very easy to separate. So that is why it is heated to 90 degrees and more. 
to make it much more fluid. And this is the diagram we have for the fuel system. This I have taken from the internet and in principle it is okay. But to draw an exam, a diagram in the exam, it is going to be difficult to draw this diagram. So I have made another diagram which is much easier to draw. And this is the diagram. But this will be also satisfactory for an explanation. Here you have a double bottom tank on the ship where the oil bunker is stored. And this tank has got steam heating which allows the oil to heat up or warm up and make it more fluid so that the pump can draw the oil and fill it up into the settling tank. This settling tank is after filling is allowed to rest for 12 to 24 hours. Okay. And the other settling tank, there are always two settling tanks. The other settling tank will be drawing oil to the purifiers. First you have the purifier, then you have the clarifier. After the clarifier, the oil is discharged into the daily service tank. This is a tank from which the main engine takes the oil for combustion. Okay. There are two of these tanks. While one is being filled, the other one is being consumed. So on this diagram, they have shown you only one settling tank, one service tank. In reality, there are two settling tanks and two service tanks. Now from this tank, oil comes to a three-way valve. This three-way valve is the connection to the diesel oil service tank. So you may take either oil from the diesel oil tank or from the heavy oil tank. And then it goes through a flow meter. Through the flow meter, it enters a mixing tank. A mixing tank is intended to take the oil from the service tank and also the return oil from the engine. Because the oil that goes to the engine, not all of it is consumed. Part of it is consumed and part of it is circulated. This is one. When the engine is stopped during maneuvering, the oil is still sent to the engine, but it is not being consumed because the engine has stopped. So that oil again returns. Where does it return? It returns to the mixing tank. So ultimately, after the mixing tank gets the oil from the main tank and from the other, the oil is taken by means of a booster pump and then passes through a heater and viscosity regulator and then sent to the engine. What is consumed by the engine is good enough. What is not consumed by the engine is again recirculated back into the mixing column. So this is the general layout and it is reasonably satisfactory. But there are several things which are not correct. One is, you see, the settling tank is always located at a height well above the purifiers well above the separators. This should have been on top. This should have been at the bottom. Why? Then you don't need this pump, this centrifugal pump. So by the tank being higher, the oil will automatically come to the purifier. So that is one. And I, to avoid these issues, I made a simple diagram, which is this particular diagram, which shows you there are two settling tanks. These two settling tanks, one can be continuously filled while the other one is being used for drawing from the purifier. So first is the purifier, then is the clarifier. After the clarifier, the oil goes into the service tank. From the service tank, it is drawn through a pipeline where it has connection from the other tanks also through a three-way valve into a supply pump. The supply pump maintains a certain pressure. If the pressure is more than normal, then it goes through an equalizer or a relief valve back into the suction. So it keeps circulating there. And then <clears throat> the oil is sent across to the circulating pumps. The circulating pumps draw oil from the mixing tank and continuously pass it through the engine. Okay. As of now, we stop here because I need much more time to explain this diagram. We will do this in the next class. And Sakya Chatterjee has got a clarifier. A clarifier is similar, I repeat the word, similar to a purifier or a centrifugal purifier. But the clarifier only removes minute solids. It does not separate the water from the oil. The purifier separates the water 
and sludge and some solids from the water, from the oil. So the oil is first fed into the purifier where most of the dirt is removed and whatever remaining dirt is left in solids is removed by the clarifier. Both are identical to look at. The only thing is, in the purifier, you have a blind disc, whereas in the purifier, you have a normal disc. The normal disc allows the water to come out, allows the oil to come out separately. In the clarifier, only the oil comes out. The clarifier stores the solids that are trapped inside. That's all. Okay. I think you have another class. It's already 11.06. So I'm calling it a day for today. And I also need some hot cup of tea. My throat is badly sore. So that will be enough for today. And I will be sharing this lecture with you today itself. So bye-bye for today. Okay. And about the brass bob, I want you to think. And you will get the answer. And you will remember the answer better if you find out the answer rather than my giving you the answer. So you want the answer or you want to find out the answer? Sagar Date. Yes, Saurav Gupta. You so everyone will try to find it out, sir. Oh, very good. I like that spirit. Find out. And once you find out, you have less chances of forgetting. But if I give you by the start, repeat what? Sir, the bronze uh, brass, brass bob question. Exactly. Okay, you want the answer? No, sir. Okay. Uh, the exact question. He wants the question to be repeated, sir. Okay, why is the bob of a sounding tape made of brass and not made of steel, mild steel, cast iron, stainless steel, or any other group of metals? Why it is strictly made of brass? Okay, you will find out the answer. It is not rocket science. Okay, bye bye. Your next class is going to Thank start you, shortly. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Ah, Rudra, you are saying something? No, sir. Nothing. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay.